Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rudy. Uh, Pat Vint is next, followed by Nello Podia, followed by Richard Doxey. Mr. Vint, up to two minutes. Yes, I am, Pat Vint, and thank you so much for putting up with me again. But you know, how does a, a lightweight like me, just a citizen on patrol, or a certified old person, they call me, a COP, you know, the cops around here said you're just another certified old person. But what would the city do, what would the police do if there wasn't citizens and business owners like myself for 57 years since 1956, building houses, moving houses, building shopping center, doing all kinds of things. You got to start believing in something. And I hope that the 100 or so police officers that are here really believe what you're doing here. It seems like there's 3,000 police officers and there's only 50 or 100 at the most show up that really care. But you gotta start listening to Sal DeCicio and Jim Waring because Sal DeCicio just took over my district, 16th Street, north of Northern. Anyway, Bill Gates was my council person for years wouldn't do anything. I took him up on a hill, showed him where they created a flood. He didn't care. But anyway, I respect all of you. I challenge any of you that when you're in your uniform that I've ever passed you. I never go past a police officer, man or woman, without stepping and talking to them. Because it's a terrible thing when you talk to a police officer and, and you say, how are you today? Well. You know, a little while ago, a lady went by me with two little kids, dragging them along. You see that police officer that get you. Something's got to be done here to change the reputation of police officers. You're driving somewhere, you're with someone, they'll say, look out, there's a cop. I say, thanks for the cop. What do you mean there's a cop? They're on our side. But you don't have that reputation. Talk to a lot of citizens and ask them what people say when they see a police car. Thank, thank you, Pat. We got to wrap Look up. out. There's a damn cop. That's terrible. Well, thank you, Can't Pat. you have a, a presentation to change the reputation of police officers and certified old person like me? All right. Thank you very much, Pat. The, uh, the subject at hand is the um, negotiations between management and um, Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. The next speaker will be Nello Podia. Are you here? All right, how about Richard Doxey with private testimony, followed by Neil Haddad, followed by Brian Bennington. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Um, it takes a lot for me to get up and speak in front of my peers. I've always had a hard time with that. But I just feel that this is getting to the point that is stressing all the officers out. We're worried about taking care of our families. See, Crane, when he uh, spoke up here first, he talked about how we're hardwired to do our job. I would go further say we're all heart. Every one of us here, we have so much heart into our jobs and everything we do. If somebody walked in here with a weapon, we'd all stand in line in front of you guys to save you. Every one of us. And there's probably not one of my peers here that actually feels, I'm not saying it's true, that feels that any of you really care about us. There's a lot of us that are taking care of our families. The spouses might not be able to work. With me, there's some medical things at home. So I'm trying to take care of a spouse, two kids. The other spouse will never have benefits. My spouse won't have benefits. So I'm trying to do everything myself, but you guys are gonna keep taking away from us and taking away from us. It's just really getting frustrating. You know, we were promised our money back. And if we lie on our job, we get fired. We lose it. That's it. It's done. But it seems like in politics, this should just go on and on and on, and we're just thrown to the wind. It's not a fun place to be when you're trying to take care of your family. Your overtime's being cut. It just gets harder and harder. Thank you.
Thank you, Officer Doxey. Uh, next will be Neil Haddad, followed by Brian Bennington, and then Michael Buvala. Thank you. Uh, I'm Neil Haddad with Citizens for Phoenix, and it's coming up on six hours now uh, that I've been here. Um, and uh, I'm in I'm here in support of all of you in black and uh, all of your brothers and sisters um, who are out on the street right now. Uh, and for those six hours, I've been sitting next to Paul Barnes, who uh, arguably, um, with more than two decades of experience as a volunteer in the city of Phoenix, uh, arguably there's no other person who has had greater volunteer service in the city of Phoenix. And Paul, you said to me that you, in all the years that you've been doing this, you've never seen it this bad. And so let's give everyone a review of how we got here. So in March 2013, we were told if no food tax, then gloom and doom. April 2013, four weeks and 19 public meetings across the city. That's when citizens overwhelmingly said, do not cut services, do not cut employees' pay. We support the food tax. At the end of April 2013, wait. We can cut the food tax in half. We can lose $33 million in revenue. And it won't affect services. Then in October 2013, it's bye-bye Cavazos and hello budget crisis. In January 2014, the cut to the food tax is not even a month old, yet the new boss says that we project a budget shortfall between $26 million and $52 million. March 2014, cuts to services, closing pools, rec centers, senior centers, cuts everywhere, doom and gloom. April 2014, transparency, let the people speak, and so they do at 22 public meetings. The overwhelming messages, don't cut services. Don't balance the budget on the backs of the employees. Reinstate the food tax. At the Mayor's Neighborhood Advisory Committee, I have to tell you that there are people from all over the city representing neighborhoods, and every one of them came out in support of you and not cutting employees and reinstating the food tax. The food tax was not even on the list to be able to legally discuss it despite the fact that we've got publicly available videotape and written summaries that demonstrate otherwise. It was the number one suggestion. So the people have spoken. It's just that the elected officials have not listened. So today, the city manager presents to elected officials, and perhaps those elected officials are ready to accept a way to balance the budget. And the solution is to cut the pay of the employees. The budget process is broken. This is all the problem of elected officials and the city manager. So you created the problem, and we expect you to fix it. But don't cut services, don't cut employee pay, and reinstate the food tax. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Bennington uh, is the next speaker, followed by Michael Buvala, and then uh, Sher Sean uh, Henry, if you'd like to testify. Brian, are you here? All right, next will be uh, Michael Buvala. Are you here? Want to come on and testify? And then Sean Henry, and then James Ward, I think. Good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Bovala, been a police officer with the city of Phoenix uh, for almost 10 years. And I am very proud to say that I am. I'm also very proud to say that I'm a member of this audience here uh, and a member of PLEA. I'm very proud of what they do and what they represent for us today. On May 10th, 2004, Phoenix police officer Don R. Schultz, badge number 4410, was searching for evidence in the canal at 19th Avenue and Hatcher Road with other members of the Phoenix Police Department's dive team Don came loose from his tender line and was found lodged in the canal gate and freed by members of the dive team. He was hospitalized and passed away two days later. 
He was 43 years old and had been an officer for almost 20 years. He is survived by his wife. As well, on September 4th, 1991, Phoenix Police Officer Leonard Kalaji, badge number 2387, was killed while responding to a 911 call at 4337 North 20th Street. He was struck several times by a barrage of bullets fired by a sniper barricaded in a home. A construction worker was also wounded and a cyclist was also killed by the shooter. Officer Kalaji was 43 years old and had been on the department for 19 years. He is survived by his wife and children. I've personally been in a situation in my life, and I'm not trying to make this personal, but to get the point across, I've fired my weapon in the line of duty. I've been shot at. I've looked at the devil in his eyes and had to face him because I don't get to run away from my responsibilities like you guys are doing. I don't get to turn my cheek and say, oh, it's all fuzz fuzzy and roses over here. No big deal. They won't care. Everybody get over it. I'll tell you what, when Will asks his child, are you proud of daddy? I bet his kid says yes, because he says, daddy's a cop. Daddy takes care of people. I don't know if you guys have children or not, but when your child asks, what do you do? Do you tell him you're a liar? Do you tell him you're a thief? That's nothing to be proud of. Uh, I'll tell you what, if this ever does happen to me, don't come to my funeral because you guys are not invited. Thank you. Thank you very much, Officer Bavala. Sean Henry is next. Sean, are you here? All right, how about uh, James Ward or Jeff Anders? H. Pacifico? You want to provide testimony? Please come forward. Brent Bundy will be next, follow, and then Jeff Chizaz. Good evening. On November 29, 2005, Phoenix Police Officer Paul Salmon was involved in a traffic collision while responding to an emergency call of a family fight in the area of 35th Avenue and Baseline. Officer Salmon lost control of his vehicle, struck a pole, and rolled several times. He was transported to the hospital where he later succumbed to his injuries. Officer Salmon was 22 years old and had just completed his field training program. He is survived by his parents and his fiance. I am a uh, resident of Phoenix. I live in Ahwatukee. I'm also a 15 year veteran of the Phoenix Police Department. I currently work the property crimes in Ahwatukee. I get every single felony and misdemeanor property crime in Ahwatukee. I think in 2010, uh, the population was 77,000. I'm sure there's more now. There's one detective for 77,000 people in 2010. We're slotted for three, there's one. There are people out there that we deal with, people in this community and your community and our community that these officers every day deal with that are trying to make this community worse. They don't take a day off, so we don't take a day off. Thank you. I thank you very much, Mr. Officer Pacifico. Brent Bundy, are you here? Jeff Chizaz, did I get that correct? Daniel Latham, do you wish to provide testimony? Uh, Dee Dee Barker, do you want to provide testimony on this item? Jeff Lee? Comes back, we'll get her. Uh, Officer, well, Ken Crane's on the list too. I don't know if you want to, uh, I think you already had a chance to speak, but if you want to say something again, I'll have to give you another chance in a few moments. Tim Berardi? Don Breesey, Gene Breesey, please come forward. And then Robert Fuller, uh, and then Matt Morgan.
Thank you. I'm Jean Breeze. Uh, I'm going to speak on behalf of Don and, and myself. Uh, I'm married to Detective Don Breeze. And when our youngest daughter was five years old, was the first time that we experienced an officer being killed in the line of duty. It was somebody that my husband worked with and knew in the Maryvale precinct. And when it flashed on the news, my five-year-old looked at me with tears in her eyes and a fearful expression on her face and said, are they going to kill my daddy too? And I really didn't know how to answer that question. A few years later, our oldest daughter was in high school, and a class project was a family tree, and they had to put it on poster board. And she put a picture of her dad in his police uniform because we're proud of what he does. And it was displayed in the classroom. And the next day, I got a call from the high school to come pick up my daughter, who was sobbing, because his picture had been defaced. They had taken an eraser and erased his face, and they had written, die pig, with a bunch of other choice expletives on the picture of her dad. A few years after that, my husband, was in a struggle with a criminal who was resisting arrest. And the criminal bit him and said, now you're going to die because I have AIDS. And that was in the days when a diagnosis of AIDS was a death sentence. So that was a fear that didn't go away overnight because that required testing at six-month intervals for an extended period of time that my husband and I lived with. So when my daughter at five asked me, are they going to kill my daddy too, and I didn't know how to respond to that, I decided I needed more information. And I reached out. And in reaching out and researching, I became acquainted with Chaplain South uh, through plea. And he gave me some information that was a report completed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation through their social sciences department. And it was a behavioral health report on law enforcement officers. And I just want to share some, some things with you that you may not know. For instance, did you know that the law enforcement profession is in the top three of all professions for the highest divorce rate? The divorce rate is hovering at around 82%. Did you know that law enforcement professions is in the top three for the highest suicide rate? Did you know that Law enforcement profession is the highest top three for on-the-job injuries. We've heard a lot about officers killed in the line of duty, but if you're a law enforcement officer, you're going to have an on-the-job injury, if not more. Did you know that law enforcement officers have an average life expectancy that's 10 years less than the average American? In fact, generally, law enforcement officers live 5 to 10 years after they retire. So I heard talk of shared sacrifice, and I have to ask you, what price do you put on 10 years of your life? What price do you put on your child's sense of security in their world? Law enforcement officers and their families have already sacrificed. And now my husband and I are within months of him being retirement eligible, and you want to change the rules? You suggest that it's OK to take that away from us? We may have five to 10 years left. I hope we have much longer. But you want to, we've, we've played by the rules. We've been honest. And you want to take that away from us? That's, that's shameful. You don't want to keep your word to us? You want to take more money out of our pocket? I would submit to you that that's akin to the same hooligans who treated my daughter's picture with such disrespect. And it's akin to the bad guy who bit my husband. And we expect that from the bad guys. But you guys are the leaders of our community. You're the good guys. And the decision that you make is going to have great impact. And I want you to know that it's not just impact on a financial summary sheet. 
its impact on lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brees. Uh, Robert Fuller is next. Oh, Dee Barker came. Okay, and then uh, oh, Robert Fuller yeah. will be after that, followed by Matt Morgan. Ms. Barker. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Diane Barker, District 7. And uh, to what my councilman was saying, now Kowski, Councilman, he said that basically in this process, he would like to have, you know, better uh, figures. And I think it would be good. I've several of the comments tonight you know, had to do with process and the big picture is, is that when we go forward making decisions, we look to see at the high, the most hopeful of the project or program and the low. Because, you know, when we say, well, we didn't know that that would happen and it would be de decrease in the future. In regards to the uh, police, I think that they are a great asset to this community. I find that coming here, uh, whether I'm you know, around town or whatever, the police will speak with you in a friendly manner, but you always can see they're on duty. They're on duty, they're professional, and they're looking around to see you know, for protection. Now, in regards to the money, is, is that I am relying on you because there's been a lot of discussion on this. I attended the deferred compensation and you know, pension spiking. I even got information from HR and looked at it for what we're doing here and nationally. And the thing is, yes, we want more revenues to cover you know, good pay and everything, but my question is, is that how come and we do fund the public safety much more than any other entity or department. We believe in that. But why is it that we have to pay $13 million for the police and the fire and the rest of the bulk of huge amount of employees? It's $5 million. And the answer was, it's that much out of line. I leave it up to your conscience with all your knowledge, collective knowledge, that the right decision will be made that we can live with. Thank you very much, Ms. Barker. Uh, next speaker is Robert Fuller here. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Then Matt Morgan, followed by Carol Bartholomew. Good evening. Thank Good evening. you. Um, tomorrow, May 1st, um, significant for me because I begin my 28th year as a police officer here in Phoenix. Um, officer said it before, um, it's not a matter of how you're wired, I've all, I think it is, um, but it is a matter of heart. Um, as I near the end of my career, I am concerned is too light of a word and maybe fearful is the right word for those that are don't have my time on, for those who have the 10 to 15 years on or the five years on, I was sitting next to a wife of one of the group that was just hired, the last 11 that was converted from reserve to full time. And I met him the other night just by chance and how proud he is and how happy he was and he had such a great smile on his face. After all these years, I still have the same pride and that same good feeling when I go to work as I did then. I may be a little grayer, I weigh a few more pounds, um, and I don't move quite as quickly, but I still love the job. As I think about leaving, and I, some of the faces I saw in the room here that I have almost 28 years of memories and experiences with, because these people, and the people who can't be here, somebody made a comment earlier about, well, where's everybody else? <laughs> They're out there in the street, protecting you, and all of us, and your families, and all those bad guys whose paths we have all crossed, who fortunately you never get to meet them, um, and count your blessings. This is more than money. This is more than money. This is about doing the right thing for the right reasons. We took the cuts. We weren't thrilled about it, but it was the right thing. So that's what we did. And we were promised, we were told, 
and here we are again. We should not have to pay, nor should any city employee have to pay for the sins of your predecessors, the current city administration, and their predecessors. It's just not right. I want to read you a short paragraph, and I'll close with this. On May 27, 1988, Phoenix Police Officer Ken Collings, number 3855, was shot while working off duty at a bank located at 2105 West McDowell Road. Ken confronted two robbery suspects, one of which was able to shoot him and escape. Officer Collings died a few hours later. One suspect was arrested, while the other escaped to Mexico. The outstanding suspect was arrested by Mexican officials 12 years later after being wounded in a shootout with police. The suspect was extradited here, stood trial, and was convicted. Officer Collings was 32 years old, had been an officer for eight years. He was survived by his parents. Officer Collings was also a veteran of the Marine Corps. Officer Collings was, although he didn't leave behind a spouse and children, um, was loved by his neighbors. He was my first police funeral. And it still lives in front of me all these years later. We don't need you to thank us, to tell us what a brave job we do. We just want to be treated fairly and with respect. I carried, and everybody on my squad during that years it took for that person to be extradited back, his picture on our clipboard. Because we used to daydream about, we'll find him. The next traffic stop we make, because I worked that area, I worked South Phoenix for most of my career, that we would be the ones that caught him. Well, he got caught, and that's all that matters. So, again, it's time to do the right thing. We look for you to do the right thing. Thank you. All right. Next speaker, Matt Morgan, and then uh, Carol Bartholomew, followed by Gary Elifritz. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Matt Morgan. I'm a District 3 resident, uh, Phoenix police officer for 13 years now. All of that in uh, South Mountain Precinct, 10 of that being a walk and beat and public housing officer. Um, in 2004, 7th Avenue in Buckeye, I did a traffic stop. Uh, the subject got out, started firing at me. He hit me three times. I was lucky enough through training and ability to return fire, hit him three times. He was disabled and because of a brave citizen, CJ Garcia, and my fellow officers here that showed up on the scene, he was taken in custody and is now serving 21 years in prison. I took 13 months of recovery and I was able to get back to the streets. And I, I tell you this because I feel lucky though. I'm lucky I was able to get back to the streets. I'm lucky as of now I haven't shown any signs of any permanent disability. Um, I'm lucky right now because I have a partner, Steve Flutie, that's here tonight uh, that's always there to keep me safe. On the street they call him El Diablo Rojo. Uh, he's an interesting character. And I, I, I say these things not to complain because that's not what I'm here for. I, I try to help fellow officers as much as I can. I'm part of the critical incident stress management team. That means when we have shootings day or night, I get a phone call, I go out there and I try to help those officers that have been involved in a shooting or injured. And I try to counsel them best I can through the training I've received and my experience I've had to get through those tough times and if they want to and can get back to the street or find a position they're able and willing to do. Not all officers are lucky enough through injury to get to go back to the street. I just want to remind you of the sacrifice. We, we've been getting our butts kicked out there for quite some time now. Uh, during the 13 years I've been on the department, we've lost 13 officers. The week I was shot, officers Wolf and White were killed, as we mentioned before. Uh, so they, sometimes it seems like they come in bunches. Um, and again, it's not always shootings, it's, it's injuries. And just to give you a brief description of what's happened to me, it's a description of what's happened to so many other officers on this department. Because since 2003, I've experienced a, a shattered tibia, fibia, shattered collarbone. I have a bullet in my chest. I've had broken fingers, broken ribs. I've got a herniated disc I'm still trying to repair. I've got uh, multiple blood exposures to hepatitis C and HIV. Uh, many, many contusions and cuts uh, beyond count. And uh, three car crashes and all that. And that's just my time in 13 years. And 
I, I don't think I'm really anything out of the ordinary in that sense, because if anybody spent that much time on the street, that's what usually happens. And um, I just want to remind you of that sacrifice. Again, I, I'm not complaining about that. I, I do feel lucky because uh, a lot of guys would probably call me a company man. I usually have positive things to say about the city and the department, and so much so it annoys the crap out of them. I try to be positive. I, I enjoy the city I live in and work in. And um, to, to, to conclude, um, a supervisor of mine introduced my wife and I. And uh, right before we got married, he told her, don't worry, um, lightning isn't going to strike twice, referring to my shooting. And um, eight years ago, I truly believed that, but I'm afraid now I'm not so sure. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Officer Morgan. Uh, next, Carol Bartholomew, followed by Gary Elifritz, followed by Rodolfo Castillo, Jr. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm Carol Bartholomew. Um, as a business owner for more than 25 years, I can tell you that the past six years have been the most difficult. But I've worked hard, and I've been able to bring in new business. When the going gets tough, businesses, individuals, and government entities must get tough, too. We need more business being brought into Phoenix. I know from personal experience, I was raised to believe that police officers were our friends, and, and I know from personal experience that law enforcement officers are the first line of defense for citizens. And I applaud all of you and thank you for doing this, this job that you do, which is so difficult. How many new citizens or tourists or conventions will come to Phoenix if they learn Phoenix has more than 500 vacant positions on the police department? How safe are we? And more importantly, how safe are our police officers? Because someone who would attack a police officer won't think twice about killing you and me. Did the former city manager and his senior staff not know about the $36 million shortfall before Mr. Cavazos accepted his $78,000 raise? I just find that really hard to believe. Mr. Zucker said on TV last night that all city employees must tighten their belts. Phoenix police do not receive parity with other Arizona police officers. Will Mr. Zucker return his $58,000 parity pay? The Phoenix Police Department now limits the amount of practice ammo officers can use, citing costs. Oh, that's really a smart move. Who thought that was a good idea? All of the council members need to work with the mayor on bringing new, sustainable business to the city. In my humble opinion, until the budget crisis ends and there is a lasting cure, I believe city manager, senior staff, and all elected city officials should work without pay. That might be incentive. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your, for your testimony. Gary Elifritz is next, followed by Ru Rudolfo Castillo and Dennis Smith. Thank you, Mayor. On September 7th, 1984, Phoenix Police Officer Kevin Forsyth, serial number 3289, was struck and killed by a truck while directing traffic in the area of 7th Avenue in Maryland. Officer Forsyth was a 36-year-old and had served with the Phoenix Police Department for seven years. He is survived by his wife, son, and his stepson. Mr. Mayor, it's almost 10, 9 o'clock by the clock's uh, watch. Third shift is heading out. Right now, there's 25, 26-year-old kids who are in the locker rooms, and they're putting on a vest that's no thicker than a, than a book, hoping, by God's grace, that that protects them from any danger, any bullet that they might encounter. Those guys all went to the same academy. They all received the same training. These guys all took the same oath 
they raised their hand and they swore on their badge that they would do what was expected of them and that they would honor that commitment. And all I ask is that you guys do the same thing. Honor the commitment. I, uh, <clears throat> on July 27th, 2007, I went to a call of an officer down. And when I got inside where the officer was down, and I won't mention his name because he'll be mentioned later, I watched his two officers that I knew very well tried to breathe life back into this officer that I also knew. Do those officers that tried to save his life really deserve less benefits now? That's what your recommendation says. And if I were, I implore that you spend the next several days really asking yourself, do these heroes that are all here and the ones that are out there really deserve less? Thank you. Thank you very much, Officer Ello Fritz. Uh, Rudolfo Castillo, Jr., are you here? All right, how about uh, Dennis Smith? Please come forward, and then followed by Michael Kadat. Good evening, Council. <clears throat> My name is Dennis Smith. I've been a Phoenix police officer for 15 years now. I've been working graveyard shift patrol the entire time. On February 7th, 2012, at 2300 hours, I was confronted with a subject with a gun, and I was lucky and I won that gunfight. But there's, not, there's other officers that were never that lucky. On June 16th of 1975, Phoenix Police Officer Gilbert Chavez, number 2684, was shot by a juvenile suspect during a burglary of a radiator business located at 2034 West Jackson Street. Officer Chavez entered the business and struggled with the suspect. Officer Chavez was critically wounded but managed to radio for assistance before dying. Officer Chavez was only 22 years old and had been an officer for one year. He was survived by his wife. I have to tell you, in my 15 years on this department, this is the lowest morale I have ever seen. And it's coupled with the cuts and benefits and pay, and especially over the last two years, of a draconian management that you guys have brought into existence. I have never seen it like this before in my life. I used to look forward to going to work. I love my job, and I still love dealing with citizens. But putting my uniform on at night, I just want to go home and be with my family. Because I feel like there's no protection from our management, and the only protection we have is from plea. I feel like you guys brought our certain management into existence to destroy the union so we have no bargaining power or protection when we do get into instance. In fact, tonight, I worked last night. I got four hours sleep, came to work, and I came for this. I'm exhausted. And I just got a message from my sergeant that I need to rush in right from here because four guys showed up to work in an area where we're supposed to have 10. But because of our staffing levels, we only have seven on my squad in an area that we used to have 10 to 12 people. This is a metro center area, okay? It's a dangerous area. This is the same area where Las Palmeritas shooting happened with White and Wolf. Four is not enough, guys. I don't feel safe. Nobody's got my back. In the same area, I have two fire stations. That's 12 to 14 firefighters to deal with a subject with a heart attack or a car accident. When there's, I'm lucky to get an officer to go to a subject with a gun call. Is, is, that, is that really where, where we've come? This is ridiculous. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Officer Smith. The next speaker will be uh, Michael Cadet, and then followed by Franklin Marino, followed by Bradley Geis. Thank you, Mayor, Council. I just want to give you a little uh, how my day starts. I'm sure each of you that have children at home, they tell you they love you, and you give them a kiss, and you go on to work. My day starts with the same way, except for my 9-year-old and my 13-year-old and my 20-year-old now still say to this day, be safe, Daddy. Every day I have to, that's how I leave home, is hearing those words from them, not knowing if I'm going to come back to them. 
I've been a police officer for 16 years in the city of Phoenix, and I love my job. Um, more particularly, I uh, investigate graffiti crimes as well as hate crimes. When I came to the unit, uh, before the first round of the budget cuts, there was eight detectives up there. Then we went down to two, and we begged and pleaded, and we finally got two more. So we got four detectives investigating graffiti and hate crimes for the whole city of Phoenix. We cannot lose any more. Um, the, the citizens deserve better from us to give them everything that we have as far as investigators, and we're stretched to the limit. Um, you know, I'd rather today be across the street honoring the brothers and sisters we've lost. So today I do that by reading this. On January 29, 1984, Phoenix police officer Kenneth E. Campbell, 3973, died in an automob automobile act collision while pursuing a speeding motorist near 27th Avenue and Butler Road. Officer Campbell was 28 years old and had been an officer for three years. He is survived by his wife and young sons. Ken's brother and sister were also Phoenix police officers. Uh, one other thing too is, I'll, you heard Rob Fuller talk. You always remember that first one when I, when I came on. And that first one was Mark Atkinson. And uh, it was, that was pretty hard, pretty rough. Didn't know if this is the job that you want to do, but it is. I love doing this job. And I'll never forget my son while we're watching the news, hearing the, the, the uh, comments made about Mark Atkinson. He started crying, and I said, son, he's three years old. What's wrong? He goes, he's talking about Mark Atkinson's kid and said, he's never going to have a daddy anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Cadets. Uh, Frank Litton Marino, to provide testimony, followed by Bradley Geis, followed by Shannon McGee. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Franklin Marino, and for the past almost 25 years that I've lived in Arizona, I have resided in Northeast Phoenix for about 21 of those years. Uh, I live in Councilman Waring's district. And the reason I live up there is because that's the first area that I visited when I came out here on vacation in 1988. I'm a homeowner, I'm a taxpayer, and I vote, and I find it quite appalling of the fiscal irresponsibility of this city. This is a city that's supposed to be a world-class city. I've heard that several times this evening. We're supposed to be a number one tourist spot. People are supposed to come here and visit. And when they come here and visit, they spend their tax dollars. They stay at our resorts. They shop at our businesses. And many of them, like me, eventually move out here and become residents. But at the rate we're going, I don't see that happening. I also happen to be a Phoenix police officer. I'm a 19-plus year veteran of the Phoenix Police Department, and I'm the secretary of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, and I represent these officers that came here tonight on their own time, many prior to their shift, so we could stand together. As we've heard, we have 500 less officers now than what we had several years ago. We're continually doing more with less. I'm currently assigned to the Central City Precinct, which is one of the two half precincts in the city. You might not be aware of this, but on any major holiday, whether it's Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Christmas, New Year's, Fourth of July, Memorial Day, we have a total of eight officers working the street with one supervisor. This is routine. We get one major incident, the entire precinct is tied up because we don't have the assets out there because we're forced to take the holidays off. I want to read something. Phoenix Police Officer Ignacio Conchos and Phoenix Police Detective John Davis. On July 1st, 1982, Phoenix Police Officer Ignacio G. Conchos, number 2853, and Phoenix Police Detective John Davis, number 1841, were shot attempting to locate a bank robbery suspect inside a bar at 44 East Southern Ave. Both officers were wounded when the suspect started shooting inside the bar. Officer Conchos died that day. Detective Davis battled his injuries for over a month before succumbing to his wounds on August 6, 1982. Officer Conchos had been selected by the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 720 as Outstanding Policeman of the Year. Officer Conchos was 39 years old and had been on the department for seven years. 
He's survived by his wife and four children. His daughter Yolanda would later become an employee of the Phoenix Police Department. Detective Davis was 48 years old and had been on the department for 12 years. He's survived by his wife and two children. On September 10, 2002, Phoenix police officer Beryl Wayne Scott, number 5580, was killed while responding to assist in the investigation of a fatal traffic collision. Officer Scott was riding his police motorcycle traveling south on South 7th, correction, traveling south on 7th Street at Thunderbird when a motorist pulled in front of him and the two collided. Officer Scott was 35 years old and had been on the department for 11 years. He survived by his wife, who was six months pregnant at the time. Prior to joining the Phoenix Police Department, Officer Scott served as an officer with the El Mirage Police Department. He was killed in almost the same location as Officer Patrick Briggs, who was mentioned earlier. And I remember that day because I worked off duty with Officer Scott. Last time I saw him was, was on a Friday morning as we were both leaving our off-duty job. Now, we've heard about officers that have been killed in the line of duty. Well, there's also a lot of officers that are injured in the line of duty. And it's not small injuries. Many of these injuries are crippling injuries that have effectively ended their careers and pretty much ended their lives. One thing about cops, and it's been said before, we age in dog years. Because many of us, if we're lucky to make it through retirement, we're lucky to survive past retirement. These people go out here every day and they put their life on the line for the citizens of this city. We've taken cuts, we've worked with the city to help balance the budget, but we're tired of having the budget balanced on our backs because of fiscal irresponsibility. Please do the right thing and take care of our police officers and make this a world-class city like we should be. All right, uh, Bradley Geis is next, followed by Shannon McGee, followed by uh, Melanie uh, Bar Beretta, Bassett, excuse me. Please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Officer Bradley Geis. My friends and family know me as Butch. I've been uh, on the Phoenix Police Department for 25 years now and can honestly say that I do love my job and have had a fortunate uh, situation to where I unlike some of these guys, have had the same partner for 14 years and I primarily work in a pl uh, plainclothes capacity. I have a guy that has my back all the time. Most of these guys do not, and I'm here to speak for them. Um, I'd like to, to read this in memory of all the officers that have been killed in the line of duty. On July 26, 1990, Phoenix Police Sergeant John W. Demblinski, serial number 2647, and Phoenix Police Sergeant Danny L. Tunney, serial number 1437, were killed when an impaired driver crossed the center line and collided head on with their unmarked police vehicle at 10,800 North 7th Street. Sergeant Tomblinski was 42 years old and had served on the department for 17 years. He is survived by his wife and two children. Sergeant Tunney was 47 years old and had 23 years on the department, and he is survived by his wife and five children. And I can honestly say that I can speak for just about every one of these officers here, that every time an officer is killed in the line of duty, a piece of us goes with them, okay? I just ask that you guys realize this, recognize this, and support us. Thank you. <laughs> 